This is a special presentation of Wapaka Community Media, Win TV, Wapaka Radio FM 96.3. Governor Scott Walker stopped by for a press briefing after a special listening session here at the city of Wapaka, August 23rd, 2016. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about what some of the topics are that yeah. come up at the yeah. listening yeah. sessions like this? Yeah, this is nice. This is our 58th. We try to do one in every county and every part of the state of Wisconsin. The idea being we're going to do a long-term strategic plan. Just think it makes sense to to go to every part of the state of Wisconsin and every county. And, and what we do is, instead of doing it like they do with legislation, where they have big public hearings where you might have you know, a couple hundred people and people get like a minute or two to talk, what we try to do is do groups of about 35 or 40, get a nice sample. So we had a number of high school students, a teacher, a superintendent, but then we had small business owners, healthcare professionals, a pastor, a retirees, a mix of things. And interestingly enough, the themes are pretty consistent in each of the 58 that we've had. Today, a lot of talk and attention about workforce and education issues. The employers telling us, as we hear all across the state, lots and lots of jobs to be filled, but unfortunately not enough people, at least not enough people with the skill sets to match those job openings. And so a lot of talk about how do we support and improve not just K through 12 education, but how do we help our students get ready for the next step after high school, whether it's an apprenticeship, technical college, University of Wisconsin, or a private college or university, how do we make sure we're helping students early on, you know, even in sixth and seventh grade, start thinking about what's their career choice, and start helping, which is good for the student, but also obviously good for employers who are desperately looking for more workers. I know a lot of those things tend to always switch to financial topics, how are we going to pay for things, and I know being from OPAC and being here for a number of years, Wapaka lost about $8 million in state aid for public schools over the last six or eight years, and so they were struggling with budgets. Now I see Wapaka is supposed to be getting a bump in their state aid this year for the first time in quite a long time. Where is that generally headed that you see in the next couple of years? Well, two different areas. That in terms of state aids, we'll put more money overall in the public education's next budget. I've commended that all the savings that we get from how we change the way, improve, reform the way we provide health insurance for state employees, all that money that would otherwise fall to the, uh, the general fund, that will all go into increased funding for public education. Part of it will go just in the overall formula, but part of it in particular will probably target uh, more towards uh, rural districts, so transportation aids and what's called sparsity aids, just because there's high cost with busing and high cost with areas where there's a lot of rural or wooded areas, and so there's unique needs that we want to help out in that regard. Certainly that would help districts like this and others like similar to that across the state. Um, so education will be a key part of that. Yeah, right now statewide, you look at one of the ways that we uh, calculate all the different aids for education and education-related funding. It's actually up above where it was uh, before I took office. Obviously, the first year, because of the changes that we made in the budget, that's where we offset it with Act 10 and many school districts, the vast, vast majority used those reforms and saved enough money to more than make up the changes. But it was up in, in individually to each school district to decide. Going forward, there'll be more money uh, in the budget in the future for public education. And uh, we're talking about more money or maybe not more money, but I know our police chief is here and one of the things he's looking at for his officers because of the concerns these days with all the officer-involved shootings, oh, yeah. body armor, yeah new helmets, things like that. Is there state money that's available for some of that stuff or, or not so much yet, but it's something that might be coming? Well, there are some things. There are things right now that the, the Attorney General through Department of Justice administers that are both state and federal funds. Uh, it used to be under my control as governor because previous governors wanted control over that. We actually turned that over in a previous budget to the Justice Department because I thought it should be made based on public safety, not as political dole outs. Um, even that runs kind of contrary to self-interest as an elected official, but I just thought it made more sense in the Department of Justice so they can provide grants and assistance to help with not only equipment for individual officers, but sometimes even equipment for vehicles and others, uh, equipment that the departments can use themselves. If you don't mind, I'll ask you a political question. Sure. Something that came out in the news today, and that was the um, new committee ethics commission was going to vote on whether they should be allowed to make political donations while sitting on the ethics 
commission. What are your thoughts about that? To me, the idea they said they were in a prohibitive market, that was fine with me. I mean, I, for example, with my cabinet, all the people that work for me as department and agency heads, uh, I prohibit them from giving contributions uh, to me. I was telling them the best thing they can do for me is just do a good job. <laughs> um, and then that way there's not a conflict. People don't say, well, they're working for him because they give him money for his campaign. I, I've done that even when I was county executive before I was, was governor. So I think that makes sense. Do you have some goals in mind, Governor, for the next upcoming legislative session? Tar yeah, targets? Yes. Yeah. And part of it comes out of these listening sessions, what we've heard already, and we'll listen to future ones. Um, we're at 58, so we'll probably get close to 80 or more by the time we're done at the end of the year. Uh, but uh, in the budget, as I mentioned, more money now for public education. We'll put more for Medicaid, which helps care for needy families, children, and seniors. We'll put more definitely into our technical colleges. I've done a lot of work a lot of money in the last few years in our technical colleges just because there's such a high demand particularly for skilled trades and for health care our technical colleges do a great job in that regard um, we'll probably put some more in we're talking negotiating with the university of wisconsin to put more in but i want to tie it to performance so we're not just giving them a blank check but to me it's not just about enrollment it's about uh, how many people not only enroll but how many graduate how many graduate within a reasonable time how many graduate and get hired somewhere? How many stay in the state? Those to me are all real important things. So we're not just educating students and then they're going elsewhere around the world. I mean, obviously some are gonna go, but you know, I'd like to think that the vast, vast majority of graduates in the UW system would be people who would be employed here in the state of Wisconsin and, and in turn want to stay here. That would be a part of our, not just our economy, but part, part of our quality of life. And then other things, uh, we're going to look at ways to continue to make college more affordable. We froze tuition four years in a row. Uh, we're looking at some options there, everything from continuing to freeze to potentially even lowering tuition, uh, finding ways to help in high school, help uh, high school students take on even more credits if they'd like, so that they can get, you know, sometimes, I was at one of our technical, actually two of our technical colleges today, we help them with dual enrollment programs so students can get anywhere up to a year, 32 credits. Here's where the credits, I'd like to do more for both technical college and four-year undergraduate college. Uh, those are all going to be uh, priorities for us in the next session. Any, any discussion come up in any of these listening sessions about um, drunk driving laws? Uh -huh. Yeah, we just had a, someone talked about particularly repeat offenders. Uh, I just signed a, a major law, well, I signed a couple of others, but one in particular major law that deals with multiple offenders, so we'll see what the impact of that is. Uh, that's just going to effect, but certainly it's an area where, to me, if someone's, uh, I mean, obviously, idea in an ideal world, you'd like to have people never uh, commit a drunk driving offense, but particularly if someone's had more than one, uh, they're a real danger, and uh, we got to, you know, just from a public safety standpoint, need to continue to be vigilant. I know one of the complaints, and I'll say it publicly, one of the complaints in this county is that our judges in this county are often too lenient on repeat offenders in terms of sentencing. Yeah. Uh, do we need to come up with mandatory minimums um, so that so you take some of that out of the hands of judges and attorneys who get together because the public isn't seeing changes yet in behavior of these repeat drunk drivers? Uh, or is that going too far? Well, it's a balance. I mean, it's one of those. I mean, it, you got it, It's a tough balance because on um, on the one hand, I can feel the frustration, particularly of people being lenient in areas like that. On the other hand, one of the constant things we hear from people across the state is the criminal justice system is so, so full it costs people so much. Uh, you know, why are you sending people, so many people, to places that cost twenty five thousand dollars or more a year when we could be using that money for schools or colleges or others? So it, it's a balance. I think people, again, if somebody's a multiple offender, uh, it's not just a matter of punishment, it's actually literally a matter of public safety. One of the things we're looking at, and maybe that would make judges more likely to think differently in sentencing, is could we find alternative ways to take someone who's a multiple offender and put them under the authority of the state, but not in a full-scale prison, but rather in a place where they still wouldn't have lost their freedoms, but it would almost be like a, an apartment building where they'd have somebody monitoring at the front and the back. But for most people who've committed drunk driving offenses, they're not at risk of, of escaping. Their risk is if they get behind wheels after they've consumed alcohol. 
there might be cheaper, you know, less expensive ways to do the same thing. Okay. Almost need to think outside the box yeah, a little bit. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to monopolize. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about water issues. Yeah, sure. Uh, recently, uh, testing a part of the wells in Kiwani County has found widespread contamination, mm -hmm. and some of that's been linked to large dairy farms and aerial manure spraying. At the same time, there's been high capacity wells that have been blamed for drawing down water levels in a long lake in the Little Plover River in central Wisconsin. I was wondering if you tell me what your administration is going to do to protect Wisconsin's water. We have new administrative rules that were proposed by the Department of Natural Resources, um, particularly for target areas like the Karst region and Kiwani, which the manure was found. It wasn't certain whether it was from large or small or somewhere in between. Um, that's just what some had said, whether it was large, but arguably large-scale operations actually have very stringent laws that have been placed long before I was governor in terms of nutrient plans and holding facilities. Uh, I love farmers of all sizes, but it's probably more likely it came from small or mid-sized farms that don't have some of those requirements in terms of storage of manure and things of that nature. Either way, though, it's particularly in that area, it's unique because the Karst region, you have very low depths before you get the groundwater, and so there's a very legitimate concern. We've done the testing. We've done it in conjunction with the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. We're doing it in contract with a couple of uh, University of Wisconsin system campuses here, and uh, we're going to go through and test every one, or we've been testing every one of those wells, and we're changing the rules within that region uh, to try and tighten things up and address that and work with the, the federal government, with the EPA, to find an alternative plan to make sure that there's clean water, because that's that's just the necessity out there. On uh, the central part of the state, uh, some of the areas where the um, you've got a slightly different issue, like you said, near Plover, uh, in that part, going into Wood County, as well as Portage County, uh, the unique issues there, and it's trying to find out the balance, although it's trying to figure out what is exactly the source, because the some of the wells that were drawing down water um, at least from some of the reports, were actually less than when the mill was fully operational, uh, and that was drawing down a higher amount than, than what these wells are. So trying to get to the bottom of what's really happening there. Again, trying to make sure there's adequate water levels, but trying to get at the source. But clearly in the Karst region in Kiwani, going into Door County, there's a unique need for specialized rules in that area to protect water safety. Sort of answered this question, um, and that is, um, why are you uh, holding these listening sessions as the uh, invite only, yeah. as opposed to having it open to the public and the media? Sure. Well, two different parts. Public-wise, you know, when the legislature holds budget hearings, um, you know, hundreds of people come, and that's great. That's wonderful because that's the tradition. That's what they do, and and that's uh, part of what they do here and anywhere else across the country. Um, governors typically don't do this. To my knowledge, no governor's done what I've done in terms of even having the listening session, certainly not here, and I, I doubt that many others do it around the country. But what I found with these, um, when they hold public hearings for the budget, hundreds of people come and they get like a minute or two to talk. And I thought if we're going to do long-term planning, I really wanted to have a, a lengthier discussion. So we hold the session for about an hour and a half. Um, and the reason we do an invited group is so that we get a, a unique sample of people. I mean, one of the teachers was a union negotiator, so it's not like I handpick uh, people here. I've got, you know, people who are probably from Republican to Democrat and everyone in between, and they all get equal access to talk about what's going on. But what we try to do is get a sample of different types of people from teachers, students, superintendent, pastors, farmers, small business owners, chamber of commerce, um, retirees, veterans, figuring that that way there's no one group that's dominant, that you get a nice sample or slice of different people within a community. Um, you know, you get some, you know, they'll protest that hate me no matter what. I could I could do a proclamation honoring their parents and they'd say it was wrong. Um, so there's some people that won't like whatever we say. Uh, but like I said, the, even those that that uh, wouldn't necessarily be a political ally of mine, all get an equal chance to have a say and, and participate. And that's what we want. We want a nice 
uh, SAMP out there. In terms of the media, it's simple. It's less about you guys in, in uh, print or electronic, and it's more about we posted events like this in the past with TV, because uh, we open it to anybody, then we do it to media, is that it, frankly, you get one or two people that talk and the rest of the people are intimidated with TV cameras there. So it's as simple as that. But we can give you a list. You can talk to anybody you want that went to the event. We always say we have, it's nothing private. It's just literally, we found that people are much more likely to talk, not just to me, but to each other, if they, uh, if they don't have a TV camera blaring in their face. Sure. Oh, Bob's writing, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. When is my Highway 13 going to get open up by Mellon? And <laughs> my my <laughs> in-laws live up in Bayfield, and it, my road's closed. <laughs> well, that one, we've been, yeah, we've been, sh I don't know the exact time we in that, but we've shifted a fair amount of transportation dollars over there just because after the flooding, yeah. that was so critical to get that over here. We did first U.S. Highway 2 because that's such a critical um, for commerce and transportation and public safety. I have to go back and look at the timeline, but mm -hmm. I've been up there about four times uh, just to be on top of it, making sure that not just for transportation needs, but there are other needs that we're, we're up and up. Okay. Typically when they do those kind of like bridges and stuff, don't they have to have environmental impact statements? Do they have to do that when they do something in an emergency situation like this? No, you get some, you get some leeway because it's a federally declared disaster area. What we did to help speed things up a little bit is besides just our normal Department of Transportation and the contractors we work with, uh, I sent the National Guard up there to do some work on refortifying some of the, the shoulders and things of that nature to help the counties and the towns deal with some of their roads as well. Okay. And there's an engineering group, uh, 724, that's really good at helping out with that. Years ago, I deployed them to do, after the wind blows, some of the same sort of work mm -hmm. on right-of-ways. It's hoping that it's open by Christmas. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I would think, I don't know the exact timeline, but that's okay. those are all going to be done in short order. Good. All right. So I have one more question. Great. Great. I would Great. like to see that list of people who... Uh, yeah, he can email too if you got an email list. Yeah, like so you can ask any of them. We do that all the time. The reporters will you know, talk to people and ask what they thought about it, which for us, like I said, is no problem. Just speaking of transportation, I know for uh, station we're at is yeah. in shot up. And they're doing a lot of work around the airport road, which is kind of a highway that's been limited due to statewide initiative in terms of not enough volume of traffic, so they're narrowing lanes. Mm -hmm. Kind of a little bit of a hot topic, a lot of people are upset, but is that really statewide? Like how many highways are really being affected by that? Or might you that you're kind of narrowing the lanes a little bit, going from four lanes total to two in the turn lane? Is that something that's continuing across the state? No, that's really not a state policy as much no. as that. I mean, it's not anything out of the budget or anything like that. That's just a policy of a engineer or engineering teams, oh, okay. you know, related to safety issues in, in particular is. In terms of what we're doing is the budget request I've asked for from our Secretary of the Department of Transportation will come out September 15th, is to put more money into local aid so counties, municipalities will get more for local roads and bridges and so forth. And then we'll make a priority on, on state highway maintenance. Where we're shifting money out of is not projects like that, it's we're greatly reducing how much money is going to uh, mega projects in Milwaukee. When we came in, two things: Governor Doyle had taken about 1.4 billion dollars, was rated out of the state transportation fund. So we've been trying to backfill it for a lot of that. Uh, the other part is we inherited these big projects down in Milwaukee, in the Milwaukee area. Uh, Mark Henner change was already done. The zoo had, had queued up already by the time we got there. Although I instructed our our team there, the secretary came back and shaved about just shy of $600 million off that project. To show you how big that is, they saved $600 million or almost like six nine or five ninety. Uh, but they saved almost $600 million, uh, just by changing the way they did some of the things down there. But there's a whole bunch of other projects that for years before I got there, the Department of Transportation wanted in the block here. And I just said, no, we, we need to, before we start big new things like that, we got to take care of local roads and state highways elsewhere across the state. That's really going to be our focal point. There we go. Great. Thanks, guys. Good, Good to see you. Nice to see you. Good to see you. This has been a special presentation by Win TV and Wapaka Radio FM 96.3.